Hey YouTubers, this is Lonnie Clark, Nuts for Art, and I'm going to read the last of the book of Population Control Through Nuclear Pollution. And I think I'm going to read the appendix. Uh, it's not related to the topic of the book. It's about poverty, but I think it does speak to today. So I'm going to also read that when we're finished with this. I want to thank everybody for following this video post and getting some use out of it anyways. Um, there's a lot of good information in here, and I hope all of us will uh, really begin to do some research. I think what I will do is make another video post and then scroll in at the very last pages um, of all the notes. I mean, there are, check out all of this. Like, there are so many. This book is well annotated. And just the value alone on following these links, getting this original scientific information is super valuable. So I am also, that's going to be another thing that I do. I'm going to read the appendix, which is a few pages, and then I'm going to do another video where I show all the links so that all of us can start doing our own research because uh, these people are doubling down. Um, the WIND initiative is coming to the Northwest. Um, and so this guy, Chuck Johnson, I found out, is coming to uh, Eugene, Oregon, and he's going to give a talk about the need for safety with nuclear power and how nuclear power isn't that bad if we just make it safer. I think that's going to be the thrust of his talk. I actually offered to pay for him. This was a long, quite a while ago. And I said, look, anybody who's anti-nuclear that you can come here would be great. And then uh, this event that happened with the uh, Mimi German and her friends up in Salem made me rethink that. I think I am actually going to still, if they need the money, I will sponsor him because I want to have it on videotape. I want to confront this guy about how he can possibly think, what what is it, 71 millionth or 71 billionth? I think it's 71 billionth of a gram of plutonium is lethal. So how we can think about even putting anything that produces that product into our environment and calling it safe under any terms is beyond me. So let me get reading. We are on this, uh, the subtitle, we are in chapter 12. The new, the title is of the chapter. I'm all tongue tied here. I guess I'm excited because we're at the end of the book. The urgent need for scientific adversaries. And then we are on the new subtitle called the goals of science should be questioned. An immediate task ahead is to diminish and bring into focus the unwarranted existing public and congressional confidence in science and technology. An adversary group of scientists must demonstrate how and why science technology are failing to meet the needs of society. Not only are they not meeting such needs, but they are seriously compounding the problems. We believe we have demonstrated this in the case of atomic science and technology in the foregoing chapters. Indeed, since one prospect of atomic technology, peaceful or warlike, is the obliteration slowly or rapidly of the human species, this particular technology is especially illustrative, but it's only illustrative. It is Important to make similar evaluations of all major technological areas. For in these times of pernicious effects of their absence of response to societal needs are felt rapidly among the 200 million people. And that's only multiplied since then. To the extent that naive confidence... To the extent that naive confidence of the public and Congress prevents realization that problems are being compounded, not solved, by science and technology. The hazard grows apace. Without reprisal-free criticism, there is indeed but little chance that errors of technology's directions and goals will be held up for responsible examination. Excuse me. Coupling science with societal needs. That's the new subtitle. Coupling science with societal needs. Destructive criticism only leads to destruction. 
Hence, such criticism by an adversary group of scientists can hardly contribute to the requisite redirection of technology any more than the absence of worthwhile direction. The real purpose of serious criticism is to ask the right questions so that constructive alternative programs can be developed, programs that can provide routes to the solution of problems of society. Blind opposition to technology is of little more merit than blind faith to its supposed infallibility. Much of science and technology is uncoupled from our society's needs because the right questions were never asked by either one. How is it possible to understand that in an era of technological miracles, we are faced with extensive poverty and extensive unemployment? How else is it possible to understand technology's insatiable devouring of so large a fraction of societal resources to the production of military hardware that has steadily eroded the security of everyone globally? Man, we could read that sentence. That's on Balco now, isn't it? Let me read that again. That's actually a question. How else is it possible to understand technology's insatiable devouring of so large a fraction of societal resources to the production of military hardware that has steadily eroded the security of everyone globally? The environmental crisis currently upon us seems unbelievable until we recognize that technology was in no serious manner concerned with its prevention and has been the major contributor to the existence of environmental problems. Got that, folks? Technology has been the major contributor to the existence of environmental problems. Wow. In the absence of scientific and technological debate and meaningful self-examination, the right questions are never asked. Indeed, as we have seen in atomic energy, a ruthless suppression is experienced even at the first suggestion that questions of directions and goals are relevant which is exactly what happened even on this week to Mimi German and her friends in Salem. Ruthless suppression. Back to the text. Perhaps no area deserves more urgent concern and critical examination than the problem of the three phases of the gross national product. And these, gross national pro these are gross national product itself, gross national power, and gross national pollution. The first two have for so long been sacred crap cows. The third has become a nightmare. Yet all three are closely interrelated and must clearly eventually be self-limiting if humans are to survive their combined ravages. It is certainly mandatory to understand why the growing GMP progressively relates less and less to an improving quality of life and why it is likely that seriously or why it is likely to seriously erode such quality further than it already has. Over and over again it is found that we come into these problems in the middle of the movie. The question of electric power is, an, is a splendid example. Somewhere in the course of our development, the production of power, especially electrical power, became a major sacred cow. Obviously, power utilization was associated with the production of goods and services, which indeed did meet some societal needs. But it does not by any means follow that ever-increasing power utilization means a better quality of life. And it is irresponsibility in the extreme to dismiss this question with, are you suggesting we give up air conditioners? Are you suggesting we return to the caves? These are the responses we get as a result of the absence of criticism of goals and directions. It is at present almost heresy to say, to ask, why more power? Or to ask, why must power production increase 8 to 10% per year? 
The electrical utility industry has devoted itself with vigor to a studious neglect of this primary question. One not dare offend a sacred cow. So indeed, instead of structuring the problem of power production and considering it in relation to society's needs in depth, including the feature of sur survival, we start in the middle instead of at the beginning. We devote ourselves to a mad rush to determination of how to produce more power rather than why we should. Obviously, if we accepted the dogma that more power production is sacrosanct, we delude ourselves into asking what fuel resource will be used. And we consider secondary questions such as how much of the resource will be available with our currently projected growth in power production. If fossil fuels appear to be in limited supply, we go on to the next erroneous question. What potential fuel appears less limited? This is the final and last subtitle, you guys. Nuclear fission reactors contribute to gross national pollution. And this is how we brought ourselves to the current dilemma of having embarked on helter-skelter upon an ill-advised, supremely hazardous program of developing nuclear fission reactors as a source of, source of power. That it may contribute primarily to gross national product in the form of sick and dying human beings with the attendant medical care requirements is only beginning to be appreciated. That it may contribute far more to gross national pollution than to a better life for anyone is, is becoming ever more clear. Worse yet, the agency which has committed itself to nuclear fission, the AEC, which we now call the NRC, is thereby so blinded as to treat with neglect its very own alternative program, nuclear fusion, that does indeed promise unlimited power with diminished thermal and possibly absent radioactive pollution. This exemplifies the price of asking the wrong question, suppressing questions, and proceeding with mad haste in the wrong direction. What is ludicrous is that the cost of establishment of reprisal-free scientific groups is negligible. 100 scientists working in centers with 10 scientists per group would cost fewer than $5 million per year in total. Numerous technological areas which are in urgent need of critical scientific examination are spending not $5 million per year, but billions of dollars per year to the disadvantage of and benign neglect of societal needs. There is no dearth of scientists and technologists to sing the praises of technology and to worship the dogmas of self-aggrandizement. These individuals will assuredly never ask critical questions concerning growth of their own technology for many reasons we have previously cited. They can never become the adversaries so urgently required and so painfully absent. If we are to survive, what is needed is the establishment of groups of competent scientists who would criticize any new application of science or expansion of technology. Or more succinctly, groups of scientists who would oppose the creation of new forms of garbage while advocating means of disposing of the presently accumulated garbage. It might seem that we are suggesting an end to technological progress. Current misguided technologists will undoubtedly leap to this point of view. Quite the contrary. We are only suggesting that technology must not and can no longer be an end unto itself. Rather, technology must finally begin to be a significant part of the means by which it meets its needs, not its end. 
And that, folks, is the end of the book. And, like I said, I'm going to read the appendix, and then I'm going to, on another video, I think I'm going to spend quite a bit of time showing the uh, research that was done so that people can follow their own links, because this is super valuable information in here. So, um, thanks a lot, everybody, for reading the book with me. Uh, we'll only have a couple more posts. Put your courage feet on, you guys. I think we seriously need it. Uh, we need our thinking caps, and we need to keep our hearts open to love and not fall into the pit of hate, which is where they want us to go right now. So, ciao, you guys.